it gives me immense pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Fiona Kumari Campbell as the speaker of today's uh, plenary session. Uh, Professor Fiona Kumari Campbell is Professor of Disability and Ableism Studies, School of Education and uh, uh, Social Work, University of Dundee. She was Deputy Head of School, uh, School Learning and Teaching Scholarship at the Griffith Law School until July 2014. Previous to this, she was convener of the largest disability studies program in the Southern Hemisphere, School of Human Services and Social Work at uh, Griffith University. That's from 2001 to 2010. Uh, Fiona is an adjunct professor in disability studies at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kelania, Sri Lanka. As a disabled biracial person, she is familiar both personally and research-based with the experiences of living peripherally. Fiona is recognized as a world leader in scholarship around studies in ableism, uh, the idea of human difference and uh, devaluation that, that explains uh, studies in ableism, and has written extensively on issues related to global South theory, disability and jurisprudence, disability in Sri Lanka, and uh, dis slash technology. She regularly gives keynotes at international events, after the successful publication of her groundbreaking uh, book, which is uh, Contours of Ableism, the production of Disability and Abledness by Paul Grave, uh, she is working on two book manuscripts. One is um, Hashtag Ableism, an interdisciplinary introduction to studies in ableism. And the other is Textures of Ableism, Disability, Voice and Marginality. Her paper today is titled Able-Bodiedness as the Enemy, a reflective exposition of this claim drawing on studies in ableism. I think that this uh, title syncs uh, very well with the theme of the con uh, conference, which is uh, primarily resistance, because uh, Professor Campbell's work over the last decade and more has resisted certain assumptions about ableism and able-bodiedness. Her work continues to explicate how uh, reductive it is to use ableism as a way of calling out actions and behavior that we believe to be preordained as insensitive uh, to disabled people or as privileging uh, able-bodied people. Professor Campbell's scholarship urges that we clarify that able-bodiedness and ableism are not predetermined and that we undertake the hard work to explicate them in all their complexity. Uh, so thereby she calls for uh, a thorough and uh, rigorous understanding of uh, ableism. Uh, Professor Campbell, uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak at this annual international conference. I invite you now to give your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Sh Shilpa, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's uh, such a, a, a thrill to present at this conference, and um, I must say, over the years, I've really enjoyed in, um, engaging in discussions with uh, uh, my Indian comrades um, and, uh, and the amazing work that's coming out of India. I almost uh, uh, sit there and envy, uh, given some of the challenges of um, producing disability studies within the Sri Lankan context. Uh, now, I'm going to share my slides. Let's hope this... Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Now I'm not. I I thought I'd better put up some slides. Um. In fact, actually, what I've been doing recently is um, uh, just reading out and uh, speaking to a a written paper. Um. But I've just decided today because I thought people might be slightly unfamiliar with some of the concepts to to have a couple of slides. Um. The good news is if you don't um, uh, understand what I'm saying, or I'm saying things too quickly, um, I will circulate to, to Shilpa to, to pass on to you um, a draft written copy of the paper. So you've got the paper as your um, insurance policy. Um, and the, the, the slides, are, as I said, are just uh, uh, supplementary. So uh, so with that, um, um, we'll, we'll move on. Um, 
so uh, this is part of uh, my work. I've been working on studies in ableism since 2001. Um, I'm feeling a little bit old in some ways. And uh, as, my th as my thinking has developed over time, also what, are, what, what is happening is that I am also looking at um, uh, how the idea of ableism is taken up within the disability studies community. Um, and more broadly in um, communities um, uh, that are looking at social justice issues um, in, in the university, but also within social justice movements, so grassroots uh, activism. Um, so I will put I will put a link in the paper, it's actually on the first page because um, and it will be a link to my Academia EDU site. And I have a series of four papers that I've given over the um, the COVID uh, lockdown. I've actually been in lockdown since March. I haven't left the house March last year, by the way. <laughs> I haven't left the house. Um, but, um, and you'll be able to follow the progress of the ideas because I can't um, uh, necessarily uh, come up with, um, uh, cover everything today. So the background to this paper uh, for you today, um, it's, uh, this is the first time I've spoken about this particular issue, the idea of able-bodiedness as the enemy. Uh, my thoughts are somewhat provisional. Now, why, why now? Um, so there's two challenges um, currently in the disability studies and studies in ableism uh, field. Um, and I'll explain the differences between those two fields. Um, in a minute. So the first uh, challenge which uh, Shilpa alluded to is uh, the need for rigour and precision. Um, now this should be by the way in all research um, and one of the uh, I guess deficits or um, uh, emerging trends in the last, particularly the last 10 to 15 years where ableism um, as, a, as a phrase, as a concept has taken off is that uh, um, whilst we are seeing the proliferation and you, of usage of ableism, particularly in social media, uh, it, one of my critiques or one of my concerns um, relates to the fact that people, uh, when they're writing about ableism or speaking about ableism, they don't actually uh, tell us what they mean by that word. Um, and that can be quite dangerous. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I argue is, on one hand, I should be happy. I mean, when I first started out in 2001, ableism was pretty much not used. You know, it, it was rare. Um, and, you know, I should be happy sitting back, you know, in the last 10 years to find that um, ableism keeps coming up everywhere in all sorts of really interesting places. Um, and I am happy, but the difficulty, as I said, the challenge is that uh, probably 95% of the cases or instances, um, very few people um, define what they mean by ableism. Um, and definitions are really important. Uh, we need to, this comes back to the precision and rigor issue. Uh, so the, the audience, whether it be a reader or somebody, you know, face to face, is needs some clarification about how, how you are using a concept, what does that concept denote? Uh, what does it uh, not cover, for example? Um, and if that's not done, what we're faced with is we've got a word that's being used and used and maybe even overused, some people would argue. Uh, it, it runs the risk of being emptied of meaning, okay? So it just becomes another ism. Um, so it loses uh, its power as a analytical concept, as a theoretical concept. Uh, so that's that was that's one thing that I've been addressing in my my previous papers. And the second area, and uh, which will be the focus once I outline ableism and some of the issues, um, the second focus then is looking at this. Um, again, a trend. It's it's a trend certainly in in the West. Uh, of, uh, of 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 using ableism almost as a, as a sledgehammer. I don't know if that analogy works, but kind of as a battering ram um, to uh, as an insult almost uh, to accuse somebody of being ableist, um, and um, uh, that often involves 
then uh, the association with being able-bodied as 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 oppositional to disabled people's rights. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, it's a quite a apart from it being a bit nasty and um, uh, conflict-based, it actually misses what ableism um, and studies in ableism um, speak to. Okay, so I'm going to you're just going to have this uh, this cover thing for the moment. So. Western, Western social theory predominantly has emanated from the United States. Uh, um, and um, and uh, uh, yes, there's European approaches, but I'm particularly looking at um, Western social theory and the development of social uh, justice movements. Um, and these kinds of theories have, have tended to focus on the notion of difference. Um, which feeds into then a kind of minority and more recently identity group uh, basis for political campaigning. So again, just to put that more plainly, so this idea we've moved um, uh, from similarity and um, solidarity to an emphasis on differences between people, which is somewhat ironic in some ways because often social movements are actually trying to challenge uh, notions of difference, particularly if those notions of difference result in inequalities and um, hostilities. Uh, and indeed um, genocide in some cases. Uh, but these movements in responding to that, in fact, in many ways uh, have re-embraced this notion of, of difference. Uh, and sometimes this idea of difference um, is, there are different scales of it, but some, some groups will argue that this difference is almost essentialist, almost uh, uh, naturalized. And you'll see, and you'll see this, for example, in the tension around um, uh, race discourse, uh, you on one hand uh, have groups wanting to challenge racial categorization. Uh, we've talked about in the last 20 to 30 years, probably even longer, the idea of race as a fiction, as something that um, uh, doesn't exist biologically. And yet at the same time, what often happens is that uh, writings and social movements also draw on the idea of racial difference. And you see this come, come out time and time again that, um, you know, we'll often say that, you know, particular cultures or particular groups uh, have core attributes that make them different from other people. So there's a kind of like a contradiction uh, built, built into that. Um, However, uh, you know, um, and, and I should say that a lot of this is also related to the fact, uh, particularly with the influence from the United States, and we haven't got enough time to go into this today, but you might be thinking, well, why is there this kind of fixation with dividing people into groups, uh, minority groups and categories? And a lot of that is to do with U US constitutional law that really um, only uh, grants people um, access to uh, uh, remedies um, and, you know, uh, remedies for discrimination on the basis of being a member of a minority group. So you have, so the whole thing, the whole logic around uh, US law and um, US thinking um, is clustered around this idea of uh, particular uh, categories. Um, now you might be wondering, well, what's that, how is that relevant to us? We're not in the United States. Um, you're in India, I'm in Scotland. Uh, the, 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 the fact is, uh, you know, and, and again, for those of you who have looked at um, co colonialism and neo-colonialism, is that the United States plays a significant role in um, exporting its ideas to the world and, and, and they're picked up. Um, and they don't, and often they're picked up uncritically, okay? So even in terms of uh, United States and UK, for example, things are different in the UK from the United States. Um, the, the basis of community, um, how groups are associated with each other, and the same with um, in India. But sometimes we embrace concepts and theories that are particularly emanated from the United States uncritically, and that's the issue, it's the uncritically instead of stopping and saying, well, how does this speak to our lived realities, our systems of governance, our ways of viewing the human being and the concept of self. 
I'll come back to that later. And I'll say in my other papers, I talk about this a lot about the need to have um, more research around uh, uh, concepts of community, concepts of self, um, uh, to show some of the differences in thinking, bringing in Indian philosophy, etc. Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit there. So there's a fantastic book if you haven't uh, come across it. It's called uh, uh, Similarity. Um, it's by, it's edited by Anil Bhatti and uh, Dorothy Kimmel. So we've got an Indian scholar and a German scholar, and that came out in 2018. Um, They've argued that uh, this constant, this orientation on difference um, has uh, unduly concentrated on and indeed magnified the difference of differences. So in other words, if we're, if we're focusing on difference all the time, in, whilst that might be constructive, it has, I guess, the effect of, of, um, uh, of emphasising the differences between groups, the differences between human beings. Um, she, she's, that, that both of them have argued that instead of fostering social harmony, um, difference then has promoted um, division. Okay, and we're seeing, and as I said, we're seeing this play out with some of the kind of um, debates uh, globally around the relationship between minoritized groups and um, mainstream society. It's often led, and I, mean, I mentioned this earlier, it's often led to an essentialism um, of the categories of humanness, right? So what do I mean by that? It's kind of like this naturalization of, of, of those differences. Um, they also, but, so, but their book um, is not is just a critique. Uh, Bhatti and Kimmel argue that there is an alternative theorization and that is to explore notions of similarity and contrast. And, and I open with these thoughts to argue um, at the outset that studies in ableism with its preoccupation on systems of ableness can explore the similarities and threads between the life worlds of subordinated peoples divided by categories of race, sex, class, caste, normalcy without conflating and reducing differences and indeed examine the interplay between categorization, identity and agency. Now, what am I saying here in kind of plain talk? Um, right, so what, one of the things about studies in ableism, because, and I will explain what, what it's on about in a minute, but because studies in ableism focuses, puts the spotlight back on the idea of abledness, right? What does abledness mean? What does ability mean? Um, because of its, its focus on that, it actually has the capacity and well, it's already doing it uh, to focus beyond uh, disabled people, not replacing disabled people. Let's get this clear. And uh, instead of some of these ideas have been sharpened up in a previous conference I, uh, I spoke at in India. Um, it's, it's not to replace disability, but in fact, studies in ableism, because it looks at this idea of ableness, can actually look at other forms of hierarchy and um, dehumanization. So actually, um, uh, that's, that's, that's of uh, a benefit. Uh, f f furthermore, um, we can then have the opportunity to, to, to look at where there are points of convergence, where there are points of similarity, right, and and then and where there are points of difference. So studies in ableism really helps us think through, uh, in a more flexible and fluid way, uh, the nature of dehumanisation, the nature of um, of, of categorisation, um, and and I think that's good. I think at a practical level, also it allows social movements to. Uh, to come together in coalition and to be allies uh, with each other's uh, situation um, as against, as I said to you, this focus on difference, which is quite, quite divisive. Okay. So I think that, I think that's particularly important uh, when it comes to disabled uh, people, because uh, whilst disabled people are high in number, we, we very much are the afterthought uh, the, the group that's left off policy agendas, uh, 
I don't know what it's like in India, but in the UK, it, um, it, it's even with the so-called progressive left, um, dis disability is often left off the, um, the list of subordinated identities. So it allows for then, I think, um, uh, a really exciting possibility of engaging in conversations, as I said, to look at where, where are the similarities uh, of, of devaluation or dehumanization, where do they come together, and, and, and what are the different textures? So, for example, what are the different textures of racism and ableism, for example, or casteism? Anyway, I'll get on to that later. So, um, okay, so what is ableism? Just going to put the next slide. I think that's the slide. Why isn't it moving? Okay, I'm just going to put this up here and I'll talk about that definition. Um, as I said, that definition is 2001 and it's particularly academic. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about that just to unpack it. Right. First thing to say, if someone was to ask you in the street, what 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 is studies and ableism and what's ableism about? What's really studies and ableism? Um, so studies and ableism is a family of ideas about humanization and dehumanization. Now I've put family of ideas because my approach to studying ableism is is that it's my approach. There there are some other approaches, um, uh, not many because it's actually that's an issue also I'll raise later that there's been um, in the last you know 20 or so years or at least since 2001 which is longer there's actually been still limited theorizing um, here but it's it's a, it's a family of ideas and some things come together and the exciting thing about when you're working with a new theoretical uh, approach is that you know we can test out and tease out and explore um, how the theory might apply to a particular group right so um, my work for example I've been quite surprised where it's been picked up beyond disability it's been picked up by people working around immigration uh, refugees um, uh, ethnic cleansing um, and, uh, and uh, computer science, I'm not quite sure how that fits in, but it has been picked up in computer science, um, obviously bioethics um, and those sort of areas. Um, and recently I was approached, uh, this, you won't find this on the paper because I'm just now speaking to this, but re recently I was approached to work uh, on a grant with a, 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 some, with inter a grant for, with international scholars um, looking at, uh, the, the moon, uh, you've got it right, <laughs> the moon as a um, um, ecological resource and they wanted to um, bring in somebody so it's multidisciplinary to, to speak about ableism. So studies in ableism then we can really say <laughs> has, has, uh, has no limits. But the important bit is it really brings together a family of ideas around humanization. So what does it mean to be human? And it also looks at the processes and practices of dehumanization, right? Um, of what I call uh, later uh, dis dis the creation of disposable people, right? The creation of disposable people. Um, uh, ablement, now that might not be a familiar word, ablement. Um, is the process of becoming abled. Now, I don't make up words just for the sake of it. And, you know, you sometimes hear that academics come up with ridiculous kind of uh, uh, phraseology. Uh, what I, what, what, so, and I wanted to avoid creating new words. It is a new word, ablement. Uh, but I wanted to talk, have, have a more active kind of concept of what, uh, what is the process that we engage in each day uh, uh, in becoming abled, right? So, so it's, it's, it's an active term, this idea of the processes of becoming abled according to a particular ideal about okay and again we'll come back to that later it, it might be for example the process of becoming abled in relationship to be being seen as a productive worker in the workplace right um so um it's and so this 
notion of able ablement then it, it does impact on our daily routines everything we do interactions um speculations and and significantly our imagination about what is the good life um so it's aspirational as well this idea of what again what does it mean to be human and 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 uh, what is what is the good life now while all people are affected by ableism uh we're not all impacted uh by ableist practices in the same way okay so and i want to emphasize that i mean i wrote that in 2009 this idea that we we're all affected by ableism but we're not all impacted by ableist practices in the same way okay now I, i've said that twice because a lot of the the discussion and conversation around ableism actually forgets that we're all impacted every person is enrolled from the moment of birth I, can, I very rarely make grand statements but every person from the moment of birth is enrolled into a system of ableism now i'm not sure what happens in india in terms of um the kind of medical practices at birth but i can tell you now that in the west we have what is known as the apgar ap G A R APGAR score, and that that test is is administered within five minutes of birth. Okay, within five minutes, um, and um, and and the, the the young newborn baby is then ranked according to uh, and gets a score um, according to uh, particular markers um, uh, of health. Okay, so this kind of ranking uh, stuff happens. Um, so due to our positioning, some people may in fact benefit. Uh, they can become entitled due to uh, institutional ableism in different settings. But the important bit, and I'll, if I get to it at the end of the paper, I will point out this whole issue of entitlement and how some people benefit from ableism, it is very fragile. In fact, I would argue that in the era that we're living in now, it is particularly fragile. I've written in the paper that it's always tentative and provisional. What do I mean by here? I mean that your entitlements, if you are a person who has entitlements, um, you might have them one day and then your entitlements are gone the next, as I've said. So there's a real um, fragility about these because we are living in an era that there are changing ideas about what it is to be normal, right? What is the perfect kind of human being? All this stuff is shifting with the rise of uh, uh, cosmetic surgery, cosmetic neurology, and other kinds of technologies. Okay, so um, and we'll, so we'll get to the definition. I'm, I'm not sure, Shilpa, you'll have to give me a time warning at some stage, uh, uh, if you could, because... Uh, uh, yeah, don't when, worry. I'll, I'll, <laughs> great. I think I, you have about, uh, about 35 minutes. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, I was thinking I didn't have enough to say here, but one of the things is you're, you, when you're delivering papers, you're in a time-free zone in some ways. So this presentation, and as I said, it's a little bit garbled, but I will get through it, is I, what I'm really interested in discussing and talking about is the tendency to claim that um, in terms of uh, disabled people, uh, discrimination is, is, is the central problem, right? So it's what I call a discrimination paradigm, okay? And most legal systems use a discrimination paradigm. You think about human rights law, same, same thing, right? This idea that uh, m minority groups, and, and in our case, disabled people, but other people as well, you know, that, and like you can think about the experience of caste discrimination, um, in, in, in India, that, that 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 it's the discrimination that's the problem, and and um, and uh, you know and and there's a choice, um, and in this system, for example, that there's a preference towards able-bodied people. Now, able-bodied people, it could be uh, how we understand that in disability studies, right? But it all we could also understand able-bodiedness, for example, in terms of high caste. Okay, it depends on what the criteria is. 
Okay, uh, we can talk about white people uh, taking on the role of abled abled bodiedness because the white body, the white mind, whatever that is, uh, um, are, 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 are privileged and 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 seen as normative. Okay. Um, but the, well, one of the problems then about this uh, this this kind of uh, uh, approach for discrimination, and and let me be clear on this. I think uh, you know, as someone who comes from a law uh, uh, background, I think um, I, I I believe in anti discrimination law, um, but I believe it is one tool among many. It shouldn't be the sole way of thinking about marginality oppression and subordination why well one of the problems then is is this division between able-bodied and disabled is a fiction these are fictional definitions right and um and 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 we can see them almost becoming naturalized you know and and, and what do i mean by that well you know We've got cat. We we we've in disability studies. We focus on the category of disabled, right, and how that's changed over time. Some people are in, some people are out. I mean, one example would be, for example, people with leprosy. Are they disabled or are they sick? What are they? You know. Um, uh, so so you know, often that is to do with cultural values. It's also to do with governments because, particularly with the rise of the. Uh, welfare state uh, definitions of who is disabled and who isn't are, are, are important in terms of um, accessing legal remedies but also you know state benefits or whatever but what we haven't done and this is where studies and ableism can really open up space here is you know you see this being thrown around this idea of the able-bodied right as if it is self-evident if is it as if being able-bodied is an established fact, okay? And this is something I know if you've got some graduate students here today is, is, is the importance in my work is to emphasize the difference between theorizing about something and, and, uh, and, and the, 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 the actual fact of, of, of the existence of something. Now, this is a really complex area, which I'm not going to get into, but um, there is almost this idea, if we keep talking about the able-bodied as a fact, it almost reinforces the stateness, status of able-bodiedness um, and, and um, uh, makes it unproblematic. Like we all know what able-bodiedness is, eh? you know, um, and, and not realizing it just as uh, disability um, and caste have a history, uh, having different interpretations, uh, have different responses. Um, therefore, able-bodiedness also has that history. Um, the other thing that I've put in, I think I'll put it in the abstract, um, but I haven't spoken about it much in the paper, is that, um, so what, what we've got is this trend then between this opposition between abled and disabled right forget all the other categories at the moment um and 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 not only are they in opposition they are in conflict right they're host it's a hostile relation um, um and i've I've, I've also caused call this idea of um of of uh what's the word of of uh seeing able-bodiedness as a pariah uh, uh i've called it a form of ability moralism okay uh this this because uh, it goes round and round and round about you know the who are the good guys and who are the bad guys okay so one of the things then um as i said i'm going to go through uh very very quickly um the concept of ableism. So you've got there, I'm just skipping through my paper here because I've, I've spent a bit more time on this than I had planned to. Okay, so what we've got here, and again, I'm, I'm assuming there's some graduate students there or people doing PhDs, um, be careful about what you write. <laughs> so this is a definition that I wrote um, in an article in 2001, and actually it was a footnote. It wasn't even the main part of the text okay the article was looking at the representations of disabled people in in courtrooms okay in the in the legal system um and i put this footnote in and um this and and thank goodness it was uh watertight and somewhat robust because um 
I've been stuck with this definition since 2001. I have, I have uh, revised it. I revised the definition in 2017, but not to replace this, just more to supplement it. So let's have a look at what I've put here. Uh, so I've said ableism is a network of beliefs, okay, with the important bit about network, um, processes and practices. So beliefs, processes and practices that produces a particular kind of self and body the corporeal standard. So this idealized self and an idealized body that is projected as the perfect species typical, and I'll explain that in a minute, and therefore essential and fully human. So I'll just stop there for a moment. So this is, it, 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 there is this idea, um, and this is where we see also the intersection between science and, and politics and epistemology, this idea that we can pull out and say, there is a species typical human. This is what humans are and this is what they aren't, right? And uh, um, we know that this idea of species typical functioning often is still based on um, uh, the human male, and the Western male. Um, anthropologists have shown us that in different cultures, because people use their bodies differently and use their minds and their imaginations in different ways, that in, in, in effect shapes and fashions the body and mind. So this idea of this kind of universal species typical um, is quite problematic. Uh, the second part is, and I've said disability, and I've added here, or any other negative difference. So something that's negative or disposable is cast off as a diminished state of being human. Okay, so really, it's 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 a fairly simple and straightforward um, a definition that that um, um, in order to produce disability or other negative attributions, other what are other what I call other disposable people, uh, people who are, are not fully human, um, and in fact, some people might even say they're non-human, uh, depending on the group. Uh, you need this concept of 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 of, of ableness. I think the important thing in this definition, um, before I move on too much, is that um, it's it's not about a group of people. This is not a grand theory that that posits that there is an identifiable enemy, you know, an a an oppressing class that does things, you know. Um, um, it's it 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 it's, it's talks about it. The, the processes of ableism as a network of beliefs. Sometimes those beliefs come together, sometimes they don't, sometimes there's different uh, players. If you're familiar with actor network theory, you would understand how um, how that works. And it's, it's through processes and practices and knowledge systems that create uh, this corporeal standard, which by the way, is not fixed okay that's everything is moving which makes it even more elusive and hard to grapple with i often use an example with my students when they're starting to uh, fall asleep because it's all very theoretical um, I, I use the example of the criteria uh, for um, entrance into the miss universe uh, competition beauty competition uh, in the 1960s, um, that the criteria that was used in the 1960s, if you looked at the criteria now for entry, uh, most of those women would have been, um, uh, what's the word, it's early in the morning, would have been uh, disqualified, that's a nice word, disqualified, they would have been seen to be too, too fat and not have the right uh, body shape. So this idea then of, of, of the corporeal standard um, uh, changes through history and the corporeal standard, as I'll show in the slides, also changes across cultures. Okay. Um, let me move on here. Um, I've just talked about dividing practices. So one of the things that studies in ableism is it looks at different dividing practices uh, that create different categories, categories that we live by um, that resolve, result in um, dehumanization. Well, okay. Now the best ideas that you get are in the, when, in the bathroom, folks. There's no mystery about this. In 2017, I was having a reflective moment and kind of thinking about, look, you know, 
one of the things that I've really argued is if you're going to develop a theory uh, around ableism and particularly, you know, a sub genre studies in ableism, it needs to be able to cross uh, multiple social worlds. It needs to um, be able to be responsive to different forms of governance, different cultural uh, approaches, uh, different historical and uh, social arrangements, right? Uh, there's nothing worse, and again, you're, you're in India, you would experience this where a lot of the theoretical work or the social theory that comes from the West is often just um, uh, uncritically um, imposed upon the global south. You know, what, what uh, Alataz, the Malaysian sociologist, calls the captive mind, that we just kind of receive this knowledge and say, well, I guess if it's come from the west, they know what they're doing. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not as simple as that today, because we're now seeing the development of um, critical approaches um, and the, the development of indigenous theorising um, as well. I've uh, I'll put a reference in my paper. I've, I've just actually picked up a really great book on uh, India and social theory. But one, so one of the things, I, I, despite the fact that, you know, uh, um, I would argue ableism is universal, I don't mean it in the way, as I said, it's the same everywhere. Ableism has changed uh, throughout history. Um, one of the things in my previous work is I actually study uh, the idea of abled, being abled, uh, in the West, at least, um, from the 13th century and looked at how this notion has changed over time. So it's very much historical. And as I will show later, um, also there are some there are some cultural differences, but we need to do more research around those, right? But so as I was in the bathroom pondering, well, what are the, the core attributes of this system? Is it possible to come up with... Uh, core attributes, core elements. Um, I came up with five and, you know, uh, for what I call five prongs or five elements for, 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 for looking at how ableism works, okay? So then it's going from this abstract theory to that second stage about, well, how can we, how can we visualize ableism? How can we see the practices, right? And, and 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 on that basis, because at the end of the day, I'm a political, um, you know, disability activist, is to look at, well, how can we intervene, intervene in these elements, right? So I've, I've come up with these um, uh, five, one, two, three, I've got four there, there's one missing, oh, it's negation, okay, that's really bad, isn't it? But I have dyscalculia, okay, so, um, uh, okay, so I'll go through these anyway. Um, so the first uh, prong is what we call differentiation. So it's about um, it, it's about kind of um, defining uh, boundaries and borders, um, uh, saying this one's like this. This is what this is what this group. These are the core qualities, attributes that they have in co common, and, and 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 another group has different kind of um, attributes. Um, uh, productivity, for example, I've, I've just put some examples here of um, we can sometimes more and more um, in this kind of competitive uh, economic space. Uh, there is differentiation on the basis of productivity, uh, what it means to be product productive and and a scale. Uh, there are there's differentiation on the basis of, of encumbrance. Now, what does that mean? Um, we know what it means, but not such a fancy term necessarily. This idea of what are you burdened by? Are you burdened by having to look after your aging parents? Are you burdened by having to look after children? I'm deliberately using this language, by the way. Are you burdened by the fact that you're married or have a partner? Um, uh, and that comes particularly this notion of encumbrance comes from uh, workplace relations where increasingly there is demand on workers to be available 24-7 and be mobile. Um, notions of citizenship, uh, who is a citizen, who isn't, and I know you've had some interesting debates of late in India around this, uh, who's capable, who's making a contribution to society. I think we've also got this, uh, so the second one is ranking. I don't really need to spend much time on this, um, except, you know, what ranking actually is. And we do it in different ways. You know, we do it through um, socioeconomic issues, class, caste, um, table of maims. Now, that one might be 
might not strike you as a form of rank ranking, but each each body part is given um, a value. I can remember uh, again to like, get my students to wake up in class with all this stuff, but um, just to say to them, that according to the um, Canadian Medical Association, if you uh, if you lose a penis, uh, that um, uh, you will be awarded more money than the loss of a vagina. So you can go figure on that one. Uh, so you've got every a whole body's mapped and ranked. Uh, there's negation is this idea then um, about uh, what what we're not. So to make clear demarcations, in other words, um, uh, I'm not disabled or um, I'm not like um, those Jewish people or I'm not a Muslim. Um, so this kind of separation, um, defense ring, defensive othering, and even even if it, even if a person, for example, a disabled person has a, has an obvious disability, and and identifies as a disabled person, that this ne negation may happen s still by them saying, "Well, I'm not like those other disabled people, right?" So this is kind of defensive othering, um, and I've also mentioned here uh, um, notification that there are certain. Uh, custodians for want of a better word that uh that that can document um your identity and um that's disability in terms of race but it might be um it might be in terms of like caste status or or citizenship or race status that there are bodies that um uh that certify those things okay so i want to move through really really quickly um and then talk about one of the, some of the problems here. So I, I, I did this slide originally uh, for a, a training program with the Wellcome Trust, um, and of, of, it was Western ableist ideals, right? Um, so, and, and what I've done in the next two slides is had to have a stab at some other things as well. Um, so this idea of, of like body image, what, do we, what does it mean? The picture of our bodies, which we form in our minds. In other words, what we think of ourselves, that is to say the way in which our body appears to ourselves. So what are the kind of um, things that we aim for? How do we see ourselves? And I've just put it up this chart, which I'll just very quickly go through. I, I decided Decided to divide it between minds and bodies. I'm not sure if I uh, want to do that because actually I'm not, by doing that, I'm not presupposing a Cartesian separation between mind and body. But anyway, in the, in the ideal, so this is about what we're aiming for. So with a mind that it's ordered, clear, logical, and you've got your stress under control, um, rational and even tempered so that humans are the idea is that we should be using reason over emotion and remember in the history of western uh, ideals i mean uh, women were excluded from social life because women were seen to be uh incapable of reason uh and ruled by emotion right uh, uh, uh hy the hysterical womb comes to mind uh this whole thing about being self-moderating and controlling your inhibitions uh you follow codes of civility manners and speech and that you can adapt and in fact that last one adapt quickly a self-responsible i think that has become more dominant um, in in the last uh, 15 or so years, uh, continuous learning, continuous uh, change. The bodies I've just put here again, uh, really quickly. And look, I mean, you know, I could have added to this list and I, some, I, when I delivered this, people said, oh, you didn't put this, you didn't put that. It's just to give you an idea, you know. Uh, we do have gendered bodies. I mean, average height, weight, uh, how, women the hourglass figure um you know how men and women are are meant to look different um uh from each other uh we still have this idea the youthful fit and vigorous body in the west absolutely in the west the fountain of youth um uh you know and uh, almost a, a lack of respect for our our elders um long living i'm just going to go on to the next slide then i'm going through everyone um what i did is i had a um and i've written other papers if you want to have a look at this i um in one of my previous papers uh a bit of a brave thing from my my perspective but well researched nonetheless uh is uh i did look at the issue of caste and uh uh Velisary and patra i'm hoping i'm pronouncing them uh, that correctly that book um they have quite a, an interesting theoretical approach to the understanding of caste and they they talk about um 
uh, the, the caste system as being the ultimate system of human scale, scaling and, um, and dehumanization. But what are the features that mark the body under, under this caste system? Now, obviously we could keep adding more to this, but I've just pulled out some of these things. Um, so the, the sense that there are visual determinants of the body and how we perceive those determinants. So here, here again, we're talking about particular markers, right? That put people into categories and scale categories that are ranked. Um, and, and even though the caste system um, has changed and you know there are different approaches, regional approaches, um, uh, it is still linked to this idea of visual appearances, but also habits and practices, right? So you know, I mean, obviously the caste system, particularly in rural areas, even the, the, the geographical arrangement of the community and um, the siting of houses and the siting of common, uh, common resources and exclusionary zones as well. Um, but uh, so, and the perceptions from others, but it's also one's own perception. So the idea of you being cloaked in your class, caste identity, just as in the same way of being cloaked in a disability identity. And, and of course, those bodily appearances and functions are given um, uh, meaning. I put a couple of other things. This is a new one. And I, I, um, I should really write about this, you know, is just generally the South Asian ideals that, that uh, support a system of ableism. So they, uh, in, 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 we have this in Sri Lanka as well, this concept of uh, La Javaya, this kind of fear, shame dynamic, this uh, kind of deference, this idea of respectable and unrespectable behaviour. Um, I've also put down again, and we need work on this folks, uh, both from a Hindu and a Buddhist perspective, and maybe even from a Jain perspective, is this idea of what I call karmic individualism. Uh, you know, it is, it, so it's, it's, it's about really, about, we, we've got this kind of, um, as I said at the bottom, um, both within Indian philosophy and in the various schools, there is this emphasis of that, you know, I am my brother, I am my sister, so this kind of common humanity. Um, but then we've got this kind of contradiction and almost paradox, this idea that um, where where uh, we are each individually responsible for our own karmic ripening and therefore <clears throat> people outside our own selves um, uh, do not have to respond to the consequences of an individual's karmic uh, ripening. And that raises some really interesting issues around um, uh, uh, community responsibility to deal with uh, people who are seen as disposable or, or seen as um, stigmatized. Um, I've put colorism in, in, in here as well. Um, and the very fact, again, we've got this ranking according to, 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 to color um, and even the language that we use in that respect. Okay, how are we going, Shilpa? Uh, you can take another five to eight minutes. Eight minutes, that's very precise. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so I've just, again, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to spend time on this slide because it's in the paper, but... Um, uh, as I said to you, we, we've got, we know lots and lots about what goes on in the West. What we need is for Global South researchers to start talking about researching their own context, right? So again, I've been doing recently some work around Confucianism um, as a uh, philosophical system um, in China, but there's other countries as well. Uh, and it's, it's this idea of, um, uh, uh, of what's known as the um, uh, valuable quali quality person is, is the translation in English, quality disposition and ability. And as you can see there, I'm, and I'm not going to read them out, you, you are seeing the emergence of this ranking, right? So this uh, ability-based ranking um, which is changeable. I mean, people aren't fixed in these categories, but nonetheless um, gives some people entitlements and, and not. Okay. I'm going to skip over this. We're all affected by ableism. Let me go on for my last uh, seven minutes. <laughs> right. I, I, what I've got up here is three quotes. I'm not even going to look at my paper. I'll just talk to this. Uh, at least this is what I mean. So increasingly, if people define what ableism is, this is what's 
being spouted out, okay? And I have some real issues with this. Um, ableism privileges a non-disabled perspective and promotes the inferior uh, and, and unequal treatment of disabled people, right? I don't know what a non-disabled perspective is. Uh, you know, this is grouping massive clusters of people. Um, we need to unpack that more. You know, it's otherwise it becomes vacuous, right? Um, and it's extremely problematic. Here's another one uh, from a charity. Ableism is discrimination or prejudice in favour of non-disabled people, right? So, so again, we need to kind of look at what this favourite idea of favouritism, right? Um, and again, this is another one. Um, however, as disabled, chronically ill and neurodiverse academics, it was for an academic conference, no. Um, ableism is discrimination in favour, here we again, in favour of able-bodied uh, uh, people. So I think one of what, what, what th this is extremely problematic, right? One reason, as I said to you, is, is uh, able-bodiedness is, is fluid. Uh, able-bodiedness is uh, is tentative. Uh, not all able-bodied people, if we can even agree what that is, are um, are similarly situated. There are people with a whole range of other marginal um, status. Um, I think the other problem about this analysis is, and it's an irony with these definitions, is uh, these definitions almost definitions almost reinforce reinforce the very thing that people want to dispute. It's reinforcing the idea that there is this idea of able-bodiedness. I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting that really clear here. And, and, and you're either it, it's a thing, you're either it or you're not. Um, so it actually pits disabled people um, against able-bodied people. And, and, and at least you think I'm exaggerating, go on Twitter. Because often you, uh, you'll actually see um, quite hostile comments, those abled. The, in fact, that's another one that's been used now often, the ables. Uh, uh, and it's, and it's, not a, uh, it's not a term of pride, it's a, pro, it's a term of um, abuse. And um, what I've argued, in fact, that this is still built on what I call a conflict model of relations, which is um, uh, extremely problematic. Um, where does it come from? I think it comes from, and certainly in the UK, is is this is this idea uh, that merges out of the social model, right? Which is based on some quasi-Marxist system anyway. Uh, that there is an oppressor and the oppressed, right? Who are always caught up in conflictual uh, relations, okay? And it goes round and round and round and round. Um, as I said to you, also in from the United States perspective, uh, there 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 is this system of, um, of, of of classifying people into. I, I remember the word now: suspect classes. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> that language, suspect classes. So there's certain minority groups, and then the rest of the people. And again, there's this conflictual model. Um, I think it's more useful, and in the paper, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping it up here, Shilpa, in a minute. Um, in the paper, I have sp um, spent some time on talking about the rise of new eugenics and uh, what's happened in terms of COVID, um, and as well as the fact that actually uh, with the rise of what we call cognitive ranking, cognitive ranking, uh, that is by giving special powers and privileges to people who are seen as more cognitively able in society that we are starting to see uh that 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 kind of safety net of able-bodiedness under threat uh more and more so-called able-bodied people are going to be cast out into the realm of dis disposable people and that's where studies in ableism can break down these barriers and and critique uh, the different ways that ableness is um, understood within different societies. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Campbell. Um, that was that was really striking, if I can uh, use any adjective at all, because <laughs> I think what you uh, ended with this uh, idea of cognitive ranking Yep. Uh, is something that uh, strikes at the uh, basis of um, you know all critical thinking about caste, 
uh, and um, of course we uh, designate it as merit uh, right and yep. uh, so it, it would be very uh, useful to think through uh, merit as a form of ableism uh, yep. right? the way in which uh, mm, yeah oh, no 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 Abs absolutely and the thing is i mean it's about when we go into our research is to suspend our judgment and look at different things including mm -hmm. contradictions right so mm -hmm. this idea between meritocracy and um uh, cognitive ranking absolutely we need to we need to have a look at that um and how that works and interestingly there's a whole lot of new research um uh flourishing in this area which i'm really excited about but also um uh to look at hierarchy now of course you know india was the case study for louis de mont's um hierarchicus homo hierarchicus, homo hierarchicus. <laughs> um and a lot of people are going back you know he got a lot of criticism de mont um uh and 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 because of his kind of you know uh rendering of the indian anthropology but um um what's happening now is actually people after many many decades people are going back and saying let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. let's look at his key um attributes around hierarchies um the reason why i'm saying that there's paradoxes here because you've talked about the hierarchies of caste and merit and and there are other systems in the world as well but um, also, uh, to look at, and this is actually summarized, by the way, in a book by Daniel Bell called um, Just Hierarchy, question um, mark. Uh, uh, so d is it possible, is hierarchy all bad, um, given, and, and, mm. what is the ba and what is the basis for equality? Because actually, um, if we're talking about interrelationships, hierarchy, in fact, if it's done ethically, may in fact work for uh, people who need support mm -hmm. big question mark there so nobody yeah. say that i'm supporting that. Yeah. what it is is yeah. about, think about thinking through these issues is it possible to uh rescue hierarchy from its kind of demonic <laughs> unequal yeah 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 so uh, thank you so much for uh for your lecture i'm going to open it up for uh questions or comments from the uh, audience uh, everyone's welcome to type their questions in the chat box, or if you wish to raise your hand and uh, speak, then that's fine as well. Yeah, and there's no such thing as a stupid question. If there's something that you uh, I've said that you've not understood or you want some further clarity, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so uh, shall I read out the question in the chat yeah. box? Okay. Um, uh, Eva says, uh, fascinating talk, Rebecca Tolstik uh, in her book, Sitting Pretty, has a long discussion about the deficiencies of the Oxford Dictionary uh, definition of ableism, which is discrimination in favor of able-bodied people, and offers instead the following. Ableism is the process of favoring, fetishizing, and building the world around a mostly imagined idealized body, while discriminating against those bodies perceived to move, see, hear, process, operate, look, or need differently from that vision. Could you comment on this? Uh, do you see this as an improvement? Um, well, I'm, firstly, I need to look at it carefully um, and um, and think about it. So that's the thing about never rush with these things. Um, but uh, I do like the fact that she's put the word fetishization in. <laughs> Because um, mm. I think it is because um, one of the things in my um, uh, training course that I did for the Welcome Trust is I I, I said to them um, ask the ask the students and they're mainly curators of museums and things about if we know that able ableness is a fiction why do we still sign up to it you know um and 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 like for example if we know that there's particularly like for women i can only speak about women because i'm a woman but you know like this idea about the beauty myth i mean most women know about the the the, the kind of uh bulldust around kind of you know what it means to be beautiful etc cetera, etc cetera, and how they measure <laughs> up but but instead of saying you know that's bull crap and i'm not having anything to do with it um uh, people will still try and emulate that, even though it's a standard they can never reach. So I think um, I'll, I'll, I'm not familiar with her work. That's cool. At least somebody's doing something uh, uh, 
uh, on this, but this issue about why we enroll um, in these things and, you know, um, yeah, and how they change cultural practices. And the problem now also is it's more complex. This is why ableism works well here, is to look at what are the investments in this? So for example, example marketing, advertising, money. Um, um, and one of the things in my studies that I look at, and I believe there's a book coming out on this called Hairless, um, is I look at the very famous uh, marketing campaign in 1915 by Gillette Razor Company, um, which was the first time of getting women to shave their armpits and their legs. And um, I always say it's, a, it's the most uh, successful marketing campaign in history because um, it actually changed cultural practices around the globe. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a comment from Shogata that says that uh, this was a really enlightening uh, talk and there's a request for your PowerPoint slides. Uh, I'd also like to reiterate that request, Fiona, because uh, there are a few uh, uh, members in the uh, audience who would have preferred everything on the slide to be read out. And I think there was that uh, Confucianism uh, slide that where we didn't really hear everything. Yeah. So yeah, I went over it quickly. I'm happy to pass on the PowerPoints, but as I said to you, uh, I go one better on that. I'm happy to distribute the fully written paper because the thing mm. about these new ideas is they, they're not, It's this is not easy, right? If you're thinking about new ideas, you have to uh, reflect upon it and then make the connections. Um, and as I said to you, on the paper I'll send you, I'll also give you a link to my Academia EDU site. And there's a couple of other draft papers. These, these, these folks are working papers. They're not fixed. And um, some academics don't like doing working papers because they're worried about people stealing their work. But I think for me, I'm more interested in us um, having a conversation. Yes, you've always been generous uh, with that. Uh, you know, even when I wrote to you and said, can I use an idea for one of my class slides? Yeah. Uh, you said I could go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, can, I, can, I, can, can I say to you particularly, um, and I, I did this in an article that was recently published in the um, Indian Journal of Critical Disability Studies, the first issue, but mm -hmm. is uh, I, what I really am keen on doing it, and I can't do it, and it's not appropriate anyway, is for us, given, given that many non-Western societies have different degrees of religiosity, um, mm -hmm. is to kind of really engage with the key uh, thinkers and, and uh, it, like in particularly in India, in Indian philosophy. Also, then there's the, d the divide between philosophy, theory and ideas and practice. How does this get distilled down to the village level? Um, we, we urgently need that, but we also, not just as a criticism, but as a counterforce mm -hmm. to Western uh, domination and same with China at the moment we're, we're doing work in that area so we need more research at that theoretical level yes uh, I agree uh, other questions or comments would somebody like to speak out their question you uh, we could Shilpa I like to yeah, yeah. Ask, yeah but I, I didn't sorry I didn't know how to raise my hand that, that's fine <laughs> <laughs> in the age of Zoom, uh, it's hard for me to raise my hand without knowing the keyboard command. <laughs> actually, I can't, I, can't, I can't see it either, actually, come to think of it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Campbell. Uh, I was uh, taking in every word uh, you were saying so much. Uh, yeah, striking at the heart of the matter. Thank you so much. Uh, but I want to ask about this. Uh, that is... Uh, authenticity making. Uh, I am blind. So if I have to speak with a stamp of authenticity, uh, I want, you know, uh, with my credentials as a blind person, uh, with my experiences as a blind mm -hmm, person, mm -hmm. I am saying this, I am saying that. So uh, in some sense, it seems to me after listening to you, the heart of authenticity making also uh, involve crude forms of ableism, which can be hidden at the bottom. Yes. But I may not say that, I may not come across that way, but my authenticity making exercises, uh, views, comments, uh, discourses that I peruse, 
yeah. and yeah. sediment them in mm -hmm. the heart of authenticity making mm -hmm. can evolve ableism. Yep. So how do we handle that? That's my okay. Point. Okay, this is a great question, and I think you should write a paper on it for the start. Uh, um, you know, one of the things, a couple of things, and, and, and there's some tension here with this. You know, there's a theorist by the name of Joan Scott who sa who 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 says, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, no experience is pre-theoretical. Now, what does she mean by that? She means that even the language, the, the metaphors, the nuances that we use to talk about our experience is, is culturally produced, right? So, um, and, and how, what do I mean by that? Like if somebody uh, d talks about their, their um, experience as a sexual abuse survivor or, or indeed as a serial killer, there is a narrative that's already there, you know, uh, to how people explain their own behaviours, their own reactions. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to step outside of that. And you might want to think of the narratives that, um, that disabled people uh, draw on themselves in, in, in for, as a form of self-explanation. Um, why I think you should write a paper on it is this is where the tension, we keep talking about the lived experience of disability, right? That's often used now. Let's um, not look at the professionals. We need to uh, valorize the lived experience of disabled people. Now, as a disabled person, I think that's great. You know, we, we get ignored. But is it authentic? Is it pure? Is it uncontaminated? Absolutely not. You know, as I said at the start, we are all inaugurated into an ableist world. Um, uh, uh, how we process our sense of disability, our relationship with disability, a sense of self will be different and it is by itself contaminated. Um, it's not possible to escape out of that out of that system. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule. For example, you hear of like profoundly deaf people being raised by profoundly deaf parents, you know, in a profoundly deaf community and not associated with general society. So I think that, uh, that so firstly, I think, you know, lived experience is important, but um, the authenticity assumes there's something pure behind that experience. And I would say, following Joan Scott, that, um, um, you know, the, the, the language we use to describe ourselves uh, is, 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 is culture uh, bound. The second point I want to make about the issue of um, authenticity of lived experience is, uh, you know, disabled people are excluded from education, um, are often excluded. Uh, but, you know, and, and uh, there is also a deprivation of experience in the world. Uh, um, um, so actually, you know, whilst it politically might sound great to say we are the experts of our own lives, actually often we're not. Uh, we often, many disabled people know nothing about their impairments. Uh, uh, they know nothing about the options that they could have and what the alternatives are because of their oppression, uh, because of their social exclusion. So I think we just need to... Uh, tread carefully about that and I would you know I really would suggest you write a paper on it but also just to look at how this authenticity narrative is used um, it's been you know it gets picked up as a sense of kind of like a blank slate idea of human beings a sense of purism um, and I think we need to look at that Thank by you. the way by the way I'm happy to um, if you do want to do a paper I'm happy to comment on any drafts if you're feeling like you're uh, uh, a fish out of water because this idea of nothing about us without us and that, you know, my experience, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in charge of my destiny is so dominant in um, civil rights movements. We have to be very careful about this. Um, I think it's also we need to have allies. Yes. Um, yeah, you have lot of compliments in the chat box <laughs> <laughs> but uh no big uh, question yet but uh yeah if i may just uh use my privilege as chair uh, why not, why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that uh, it was really uh, useful to hear that uh, uh, there's a way of moving forward uh, by thinking in terms of affinity 
by thinking in terms of uh, experiences uh, that may be uh, similar. And I know that elsewhere you've written about uh, humiliation, uh, because humiliation, uh, again, is that, uh, that experience that is uh, common to uh, different uh, marginalized groups or the, the existence of, I mean, the lived realities or social realities of a lot of uh, groups and so on. So, um, yeah, while you're talking about that, you were also saying it would be important to draw on uh, cultural knowledges or do culturally located uh, research. Now, um, one of the responses that one often gets while talking about this culturally located or situated uh, research uh, is that, um, does that really exist? Uh, are things really so culturally demarcated? Uh, um, you know, are these separate realms? Uh, aren't they all kind of uh, flattened by a globalizing uh, world and so on? So how do you respond to that question in your own work or in, uh, in your thinking? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So firstly, can I say that uh, my ideas around humiliation are actually drawn from um, Indian studies, but particularly Cast, the yeah. edited collection. Well, there's a book called Humiliation by Gopal Guru. Gopal, Gopal, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and um, because actually, uh, and I say this in a positive way, um, I think India as a vast country is, is, is the place to go and study humiliation and, and the insights, what we can learn from this, you know, um, I'm not saying that humiliation, um, doesn't happen in the West, um, but it's a different, it's a different kind or, or, or is it? Um, now your question about culture, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? About the kind of, um, the local versus the a global kind of, um, aspect to this. Um, I think, you know, more and more we, the quality and rigor of research is is important for me. Uh, cultural studies um, is not only useful in documenting and saying, "Hey, we do things in a different way," or "We do things, you know, in a similar way to whatever that is." Um, it, it it allows us as a global community um, and as a local community to expand our imaginations. You know, it's interesting, but in terms of colonial. Um, work um, is that often people uh, in the global south uh, know more about other countries than their own you know what I mean like in their own history um, and and I'm not just talking about like South Asia even as somebody who lived in Australia uh, most of most young people know about American history like all the ins and outs and um, and they keep talking about first amendment rights and I'm thinking uh, that doesn't apply in our country, and um, and but they don't know about their own history, right? So I'm using that as an ex and that's a kind of like a, a white-based country. Um, so I think actually uh, it's really important to know um, about the, the the cultural trajectories, ableism, and I think particularly given um, some of the challenges that are happening with within India itself about uh, you know the kind of unitary relationships and the differences. Um, between different areas of India um, uh, and, and how India itself tackles in, inequalities. I think that we need, we need that research. Um, the other thing is that uh, done carefully, um, it can provide other people in the world with other possibilities. And I guess this idea of imagination, you know, imagination, I dream a dream has been really important for marginalized people to, um, to think of, uh, you know, another way, another way out in terms of globalization. I mean, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, we can do this conference now and I've done heaps during lockdown and, you know, you can, um, move materials but but uh you know globalization is is as i don't need to tell people here is is inherently unequal and um i mean i've always argued that america doesn't need to go in and bomb everybody now although it does um it it can it can colonize people through through uh information and conceptual domains and and using zoom for example um so I don't, so I think actually uh, we need to, it, it, it will, 
I think there will always be some asymmetry between uh, knowledge production and um, and academia, um, mm -hmm. but injecting new ideas. So, for example, I teach my students the Jane uh, concept of the four cornered argument. Now, some of them might go in and, in and out one ear for some of you there, but, but the fact that, you know, in the West, it's either right or wrong and you're arguing. And so I, <laughs> I, I, I will say to my students that, you know, there's actually there are other approaches such as the Jane four point argument. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about enlarging our, our imagination. Um, uh, but if we don't know about our own countries or our own regions, uh, and, and not also a story of doom to talk about the qualities, right? Because uh, you see, you've got me onto something, Shilpa, I will shut up in a minute. But one thing that really annoys me, and India and Sri Lanka get this, so Hinduism and Buddhism in this respect, is I get sick to death of saying the reason why people in India and people in Sri Lanka have bad attitudes towards disabled people yes. is because of karma. You know, <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's even in it's even in the government documents. That's the worst bit. And 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 what a load of BS. So you know, I'll keep uh, polite here. I, actually, show me the studies. Show me the in-depth studies of disability and karma. Well, guess what? They're not there. So, so you know, it's it's so this stuff of um, uh, what do you call it? Self persecution about to say, oh, we are mm -hmm. culturally backward. You know, we're not like mm -hmm. the West. Yes, we do treat disabled people because we've got this backward concept of, of karma. Um, that's why we need the research. But the research also hopefully will also uh, uh, enhance and promote conversations within communities. Yeah, uh, thank you. There's a kind of self-orientalizing that we do. Uh, <laughs> You know, well, as I said, yeah, I mean, when governments are spouting out the same crap, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and I've seen this in Sri Lankan policy, so I'll just stick to Sri Lanka on this. And I think, you know, it's totally un unfounded. And um, not, not only is it just kind of, it, it's denigrating a whole religious tradition. So then the, then the opposite of that say, well, okay, maybe the, the Judeo-Christian tradition is more civilised. So, you know, you're buying into a whole lot of stuff that's extremely problematic. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Krishna has a question in the chat box. Uh, uh, he says it was an excellent uh, talk that he thoroughly enjoyed, uh, but would like to know what made you uh, shift into theorizing uh, ableism when you started out in disability studies earlier? Good, good question. You know, Bell Hooks, who's a famous um, African-American um, woman theorist, um, she said, and I can kind of paraphrase it, she said, in theory, I, I found healing. Theory helped me make sense of my lived experience. So, and and uh, I've always used that quote because, you know, um, uh, depending on what kind of theoretical frameworks we, we develop and use, um, it, will, it will produce different questions. We will ask different questions. Um, I think it's accidental. Uh, maybe the gods were looking above and uh, uh, it was accidental. Um, I think uh, when I was looking at uh, the representations of disabled people in the courtroom, the two representations were the disabled person as a sufferer or the disabled person as an overcomer of their disability. So it probably uh, got me onto that. The other thing was, um, and this is why you need to dig deep, I, I was reading a lot of uh, work around constructions of bodies. Um, I've, I've been studying Buddhism for, for a long time. Um, and Indian philosophy. So actually, I was finding the disability studies, Shilpa will hate this, <laughs> I was finding the disability studies stuff really boring and going round in circles and um, mainly dealing with kind of, you know, white Western preoccupations that had nothing to do with the daily lives of the majority world of disabled people. So it's about digging deep and reaching out, and I'd really encourage you to do that. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes things happen for a reason. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Fiona. No, and I, I wouldn't thank you for that at all, which is why we reached out to you to come and talk to us uh, about this, um, you know, very exciting work that you're taking, um, uh, that you're doing, and taking uh, disability studies um, away, um, you know, um, and, and kind of uh, enlivening it up uh, a bit. Uh, Reshma has a. a point here. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the dominating view of karma doesn't provoke one to change one's attitudes and behavior towards disability and persons with disability. 
considering the future will be a retribution of one's acts in that uh, sense. Oh yeah, look, there's some really interesting, I mean, I, I don't know as much to do with um, uh, Hindu practices in terms of karma. I can say with, within uh, Buddhist practices, no, it doesn't. And then it becomes this superstitious system that I don't know whether, Shilpa, you were talking about before in terms of merit, but this kind of thing um, that you help people really just to help yourself. So what, it comes back to what's the motivation, you know what I mean? Like it, it's a, a, it's extremely problematic and you actually need, you actually need helpless people around you for you to be, um, uh, to, 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 to be ele elevated. But um, the other thing about it is, as I said to you, that's why more work needs to be done on it, is, uh, is, 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 is we talk about karmic ripening. Uh, karma is actually about change and growth. Uh, so actually mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a fatalistic view. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's really about, well, actually, how can we, uh, remedy things and take control? Uh, my concern is, and I will shut up about this. I mean, is, um, and certainly on Buddhism, I've, I've heard the most appalling things about disability that have come out of monks' mouths. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, again, this kind of, uh, uh, the word retribution. I mean, that's, I don't know what that, how that goes down in India, but in, you know, in, in certainly in the English that I use, the word retribution is pretty full on this idea mm. that you are disabled uh, because, and this is a form of retribution about mm -hmm. basically about you doing something uh, evil. Yeah. That's really bad. That's a real victim blaming. Oh yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of it uh, in India as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't see other questions in the uh, chat box. Is there anyone who'd like to speak that question? We have a minute Lucky or two. last, lucky <laughs> last. <laughs> You can ask me anything. <laughs> How early in the morning is it for you? Oh, it's not too bad. It's ten thirty now, so it's um, okay. it's 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 uh, you know, can, 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 as I said, can I? I'm, I mean, I, I certainly with uh, I would encourage you to support the um, Indian Journal of Critical Disability Studies. Um, uh, but you know, I must say, I was very nervous about writing some things on cast, and and, and it's complex. It's very complex. Uh, but you know, the more people kind of look at some of the cultural uh, issues, um, you know, whether it be, for example, around uh, gender roles and parenting. I mean, I recently put out a piece on um, uh, in the Sri Lankan context because nothing's been written about it. Is on uh, the mothers as caregivers and the and the absent father. <laughs> um, so yeah. this kind of um, stuff we need to hear. You know, we need to hear more about this, um, you know, how does gender affect the lifespan of disabled people? Do d disabled women get the same kind of opportunities as disabled men? Yeah, I, we have a few scholars working on that area, particularly Nandini Ghosh and uh, Shubhangi yeah. Vedya. Uh, Anita Ghai, of course. Uh, of course. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Nilika as well. And that's the area of uh, scholarship that's also uh, growing. There are a lot of... Um, a PhD students wanting to work on gender and disability, um, you know, from uh, and and yeah, and it'd be good if they use um, studies and ableism as a conceptual framework. So, uh, just to give you one example, which probably could apply to India, possibly, I've got a student who's just started with me who's looking at um, disabled parents having their children taken away from them uh, mm. because they're seen as, you know. Uh, basically ontologically unfit parents before you even look at them. And um, so we, so that student's going to be looking at ableism and family law. So it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, uh, I don't know what backgrounds people come from, but it would be good to look at the court cases, just kind of yes. ideas about disability that have appeared in, in court cases, yeah. or, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I think, I think I'm going to wind up this session. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks immensely for uh, sharing all these ideas with us and also for uh, being so graceful uh, with letting us know where your papers are and what we can uh, draw on. But uh, I think one of the most uh, useful things for me uh, is that you're drawing on a multiplicity of uh, epistemic frames to think uh, about ableism, uh, you know, and it's not just uh, restricted to uh, one, uh, one notion of uh, behavior, beha behaviorism. So um, I think that's that's been an important learning for me. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you. Thank everybody. you very much.
uh, who's been present here. And thank you uh, to Garima, uh, who's been interpreting. Um, um, yes, so I hope it wasn't too fast. <laughs> I think she, uh, Karima says that you were okay, not too fast. <laughs> okay, 